Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh my dear brothers, sisters, friends and the foes out there and welcome to another episode of the Blood Brothers podcast with your host Diddy Hussain. Before I introduce today's esteemed guest I want to remind all the avid podcast listeners that you can find this show all three seasons on all the major audio platforms. If you're watching via YouTube do remember to click subscribe, leave a comment, like this video. Today's guest is someone who I've been very excited to have on. He's been in the making, it's been in the pipeline for some time. And Alhamdulillah, we managed to lock him in. He has one of the biggest channels talking about theology, Islamic apologetics. He himself is a somewhat of a da'i. Yeah, he may, da'i, he may not accept that description, but I certainly do. Mashallah, very active in terms of punditry and commentary and conveying the message of Islam online and offline. And that's none other than our dear brother, Paul Williams of Blogging Theology. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Lovely to see you. I'm sorry it took so long to get me on, but you know, life. <laughs> but you're here, alhamdulillah, and I'm excited to have you on. Alhamdulillah. Thank you. I want to just warm you up a little bit. Oh, God. Um, by asking you some quick fire questions, mm -hmm. I hope and promise, you have to actually promise that the responses will be brief. Okay, okay. So your favourite biscuits? Okay. Um, uh, 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 would definitely be those brown ones that you dug. Um, Bourbons. That's Bourbons. Okay. Mm. Your favourite uh, TV host? British TV host. But oh, gotta be you, of course. Don't don't take the biscuit. No, <laughs> you have a link to the biscuit. <laughs> I like that. That's clever. Oh, you you gotta be the the uh, the. I mean, the work you're doing at the moment. Maybe we'll talk about it later. With some fantastic guests, very interesting political marginal people. Uh, we're talking about who you're gonna have on <laughs> in the future. I mean, you, you know, you. I mean, move over Piers Morgan. We've got someone who's actually really interesting. So no, gotta be you, sir. Are you being serious? Mm. Why not? Well, it's you or Piers Morgan. So come okay. on. Your favorite soap. My soap. Um, what you mean, soap you buy in the shops? No, shop is a soap program. I don't watch soaps. You've never been an EastEnders or Corrie fan? I've Emmerdale, no, Brookdale? No, no, no. I, I, mean, I, know, I know what they are. I've read about them in a book once, but I've never watched them, no. Should no. I? Are you recommending? No. Uh, I was always an EastEnders man, to be honest. Okay. Um, favourite football team? What? Football team. What's a football team? Okay. So, your favourite no. tea, favorite tea brand? Uh, uh, oh, uh, it's got, is this advertising? I don't care, Yorkshire. Yorkshire. York, I do recommend Yorkshire tea, but if it was a real proper cup of tea, it's got to be Yorkshire. But never had a football team? Or you I never rugby man? football or rugby, no, uh, despite my t-shirt. Yeah, that's uh, it, you're giving uh, a rugby No, flex. that's just um, Gant. I like advertising. It. So I've got Bourbons, I've got Gant, I've got uh, Yorkshire sponsors. tea. The sponsors here are going to love this. Right, Blogging Theology sponsors. <laughs> if you see them now, you know which episode. We, we, we need some uh, taxes Shane for that. advertising. Um, product placement. That's what it's called, product placement. I'm going to mention a few things. Some of your instinctive yeah. thoughts. Oh, dear. Dogs as pets. What? Dogs as pets. Dogs as pets. Um, instinctive thoughts is uh, I'd like to have one, but they're not allowed. They are. If you have sheep and livestock. Okay, so I need to have some sheep before I can have a dog. And genuine, quite, genuine security issues at genuine, home. Okay, I live in a rough area. No, I don't live in a rough area of London, but I suppose I could. No, no, it's not going to happen. And you could always convert to uh, the Maliki adoption. That's, not, that's, a, that's a bit of fake news, actually. They really? Say it's not clean. It's like their saliva doesn't render you unclean for would you for whatever. But, but you're not allowed to keep uh, dogs just as pets, even in the Maliki. No, no, oh, no. wow. Yeah, Thanks for clarifying that. Check Thanks for refuting me on the spot. Absolutely. Elderly care homes. What? Elderly care homes. Um, smelly, old, stuffy, very, very hot. Have you ever been in one? Like the temperature there is like astronomical. Uh, and there's always, I don't know why. The, and there's always a, a particular smell. Yeah. Um, and, and it's one that's quite sad, actually. Yeah, that's why my dad was in one, actually. That's how I knew that. Yeah. Marriage. Um, marriage, gosh. Uh, unfortunately, not for me. Bible. Wow. That's my answer. Wow, it's it's an amazing book, and uh, it's one of my favourite books of all time. The Bible. Do you have, do you have a particular version that's a favourite? Um, the NRSV, but the Greeks best, the New Testament. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Brexit. Oh grief! Bad news. I ended with Brexit because I know on WhatsApp we've been having some chin wags, some, and particularly about some recent guests that I've had: Nick Griffin, oh yeah, former leader of BMP, Jim Dowson the founder of Britain First, potentially Jada, and Mark Collette and others Mark in Collette. the future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, I know you've not seen all of them start to end, but what are your general thoughts in engaging that element? I think it's brilliant. I think Muslims need to uh, engage with uh, uh, everyone, not just the usual suspects, by which I mean like the Labour Party, the Tory Party, those have let Muslims down so badly, particularly recently, as we know. But um, we, we need to intelligently engage with across the spectrum. A lot of these guys you've 
interviewed are on the so-called far right, the populists. But I was just reading in the Times today. I mean, yeah, I read the Times. I have to for work. That's my Why not? Sense. I read the Guardian. But <clears throat> anyway, they, they were reporting on a, a lead political analyst who was saying the, the populist right in Europe the, for the next year are going to sweep the board. In, in most of the major European countries, the populist right are going to win, whether it be France, Germany and so on, or just come second place, which is unprecedented in Germany. That is. Um, with the uh, alternative AFD. to Deutschland. Yeah, exactly. AFD. Um, so you're engaging with some of these figures. You mentioned like um, Nick Griffin, for example, is actually a very relevant and up-to-date thing. Even though himself is a marginal figure now, what he represents is is on the cusp of a, a, a wave that is really rolling over Europe. We're almost certainly going to see Trump return to the White House if things continue as they are. He's won these stunning uh, victories in, in, in America today. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so this is the future, and this is incredibly bad news for a lot of people, not least Muslims, of course. So you're interviewing these people is very timely. And the timeliness of it has been centered around the war on Gaza. So what I've seen is there's an emerging, at least split or fracture amongst the far right, the hard right, yes. the ultra, right, and it has to, and it, it's around Israel and the yes. Israeli lobby. That's right. Now you, <clears> you've <throat> got one camp that are uh, Christian Zionists, um, un unequivocal in their support for Israel. <clears throat> and they've got this more kind of like, more of a kind of patriotic nationalist, white tribalists who are like, no, hold on. Um, our loyalty is not to Israel, it's not to this project. Mm. So they've got theological issues, they've got political issues with, with Israel. That's right. Have you seen this fracture emerge? No, you're absolutely right. And that's been the big change, I think, in the right uh, in, in recent times. The right used to be anti-Semitic, you know, uh, and, and certainly not pro-Israel or pro-Jewish at all. And now, uh, th th this new populist right that I mentioned is overwhelmingly Zionist, actually. Look at Gert Wilders mm. in, in uh, Holland. He, he's definitely... Uh, he, even uh, uh, Marianne Le Pen in France has made Zionist overtures, even though her dad, Jean-Marie Le Pen, is very notoriously yeah, anti-Semitic. Yeah. So she has made this move. Her dad hasn't. Why has she made that move? Because this is... this is, uh, I think it is, uh, unfortunately, a lot to do with the anti-Islamic... Um, stance of anti-Zionism, uh, Zionism, I mean, which is seen as kind of a bulk word against um, so, so you're saying Muslims. That, so you're basically saying that if the hard right, the example Marine Le Pen and the Front National, yeah. that if they were to take an anti-Israel stance, it would be seen as appeasing to the Muslims. Is that what you're saying? No, I, I'm saying that, that uh, so-called anti-Semitism anti now is in Europe uh, a, an absolute ideological prerequisite for political success. Uh, and because of the the Holocaust in the 1930s and so on, that's seen as untouchable. You can't, we can't go back to that ideology, this anti-Semitic ideology. So they've kind of reconstructed it around a Zionist narrative, which has the benefit from their point of view of being anti-Muslim. And so, because uh, I saw the president of uh, Israel a few days ago, uh, coming up with this trope of, of, of how we are, you know, we need to win this because the universe depends on it. He used this incredible language as if it's yeah. a cosmic battle. Yeah, yeah. The whole, the whole, <laughs> he used the word universe. Right. Um, against what? What's the battle against the jihadists who we, we are their last uh, resistance against the Muslims, basically. Before they come to Europe, before they come to the yeah, West. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Uh, um, they come to, uh, or otherwise they end up in Europe. And, or in America. I mean, as, as if Hamas is a threat to America. I mean, it's the most extraordinary hyperbolic language which bears no relationship to reality at all. Mm. Um, but many people in, in the States and so on will will pick up on that language that, yeah yeah that, that's right the, the new enemy is not the jews it's the muslims mm -hmm. so we're like the new jews if you like so before it was the jews before that was the catholics before that it was blah, blah, blah. You, you have this new enemy that, that the west needs i think to define itself define itself against the other so what are we, what's the west about well we're not that we're not x whether it be catholics or mm. muslims or whatever so this is more or less the same thing again you know the prerequisite that you mentioned that mm. for political acceptance for you to be seen as the mainstream to even have any scope of victory elect electoral victory of any yeah. sort that you have to be kind of like an ardent zionist or, yeah. or very silent yeah what does that mean then from the growing populist right then who who don't want to, who won't be silenced and they haven't been silent for the last three four five six months what does that mean for them because if you're saying that that's a prerequisite because i've been thinking about this as well if it's a prerequisite to be pro-israel 
uh, or to shout from the rooftops that you're a Zionist or whatever it is. And that, and for that, that's the palatability for you to be accepted into the mainstream. What does that mean? Will, will the populist right forever remain in the fringes? Because it hasn't in other parts no, of Europe. I, I think it's cynical. I think Marine Le Pen, the, the leader of the, the French, uh, it's, it's not actually uh, the Front National. It's, it's now uh, called something else now. But uh, I think it's a cynical move. I don't think it's genuine. I think mm. she starts to love Israel. Uh, I think she recognises she must say these things, in her view, to achieve the mainstream, which is all she wants the Elysee Palace. She wants to be president. She almost certainly will be, mm. I think, at this rate. So I, th I think it's a tactical move. I don't think they have any particular love for Israel. Um, but the, the the other part of the right, uh, the, the Nick Griffin right, the Mark Collette right, a PA, patriarchal alternative, are uh, absolutely not like that. And, and they uh, are anti-Zionist, actually, pro-Palestinian, yeah. funnily enough. Jim um, Dawson, Jada Franson, Mark Collette, yeah, Nick so Griffin. So that is there too. So, yeah. I, I mean, I'm not saying that the, the, the right Zionist movement, uh, the Gert, see, Gert Wilders, for example, uh, who's, I think, the... the Prime Minister elect in Holland. I'm not quite sure. I think he's still trying to yeah. form a government. He pretty uh, much, he probably will. Yeah, um, he, he's not even right wing, strangely, uh, because if you look at his, he's, he's like a fundamentalist liberal. You know, he, he's a muscular liberal. Gay. Yeah, um, so he supports gay marriage, all the liberal causes, but he's weaponized it against Muslims mm. and turned it into a nationalist cause. So it's kind of this weird hybrid between old-fashioned nationalism and liberal ideology. So he's not even right-wing in the some Douglas senses. Is the Douglas Murray type, I yeah, think. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So real right-wing, right traditionalists, like mm. in Britain, like people like Roger Scruton, the, mm. the, the famous philosopher, uh, actually have a lot in common with Islamic values in terms of family values, the respect for, uh, you know, the rule of law and so on. Uh, but these liberal Zionists are not really allies at all i don't think mm. there's nothing in common i mean i think people are waking up to that as well really yeah mm. I, I think they definitely are uh, and just on that what's your thoughts on the fact that <clears throat> you know anti-immigration sentiment is, is it's all it, we're coming up to an imminent general election yeah um the tories are at least from the polls and everything they're, they're, they're expected to lose some are saying a landslide to Big kirst yeah, yeah. they're going to lose support to reform uh, party yeah. um, but immigration seems to be that age-old dog whistle to get the people riled up to go for the, those middle england su support bases whatever you want to call it and i don't ever want to remove from the people and when i say the people i'm talking about the indigenous white native folk any immigration concerns a every country well, would no, be I concerned i think there are legitimate immigration concerns in the sense and this isn't a racial thing it, Absolutely not. The, the island is I mean, Britain is actually a small island. It's actually quite crowded. And it's getting, if you look at the, pop, the actual macro population, it's got bigger and bigger and bigger. So the pressure on public services and so on is real. Uh, um, but that's, that's not a question of, uh, you know, refugees uh, not being able to come here. There's a question of managing and the society we're in. Uh, and, you know, <clears throat> so second, third, fourth generation immigrants also feel the same way, I, I, I would argue, about unrestricted immigration in terms of the impact on the host society to accommodate that. Um, but having said that, so there is there is a concern, a legitimate one in my view, but there's also, and you see this in Europe too, uh, a particular um, phobia or xenophobia about Muslims. And, we, and, and this is where it gets nasty, because if you look at Ukraine, when a couple of years ago, obviously, Russia invaded, mm -hmm. and there were Ukrainian refugees, the way the government and everyone welcomed uh, refugees from Ukraine to come here and uh, put them up in your homes, and there was sure. complete openness about it. Celebrity endorsements and all sorts. Yeah, absolutely. But when it came to Muslim refugees, whether it be in Syria and so on, yeah. there was a decidedly cold feeling. You, you didn't get any sense of welcome at all. So this is part of something we, perhaps we we're going to talk about, yeah. but the the way the West, because it's not just a British thing, is, a, is actually white supremacist. And this is a conclusion I came, come to rather late in the day, but uh, only because of Gaza, by the way. This is what's really changed it for a lot of people, including me. So I, I think the immigration debate has a legitimate and a not so legitimate side to it. But to say we should have no immigration controls at all, mm. like the SW, Socialist Worker Party do, I believe, is just chaos. No, no, that's, because that's you, highly you, problematic. You'd, you'd have massive transfers of population around the world and society would break down, clearly. With that, um, with that adequate checks and places. One of my biggest gripes, Paul, with, with, with my interactions with that element of the right... Are we recording, by the way? Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, Sorry. That's one I like it. It gives a bit of a rustic, natural touch that something just happened. Rustic, and I, like, I like rustic. I like rustic. I like the word good. rustic as well. It's yeah. kind of rusticy. It's yeah. like, carry yeah. on. 
No, no. Very central. What's the, well, no, no. What's that word when, when a word sounds like what it describes? Li- on the matapia. On the matapia. Thank you. That's that, was me, that was me throwing my voice to, yeah. uh, <laughs> uh, to the back of the room there to make it sound like someone else said it. <laughs> um, so yes, one of the one of the interactions I've had, and and, and, I, and I feel that this message doesn't seem to bear any kind of seriousness amongst patriots, white nationalists, whatever it may be, is the intrinsic link between Muslim migration and war and destabilization in yes. those said regions. That the, whether it's Ira- Iraqis, whether it's Afghans, whether it's Syrians, wherever it is that whenever you look at Muslim migration, and by the way, Ion Institute did a research on how the vast majority of refugees in Europe are Muslim and they are coming from Muslim countries, be it Syria, Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan. Some are not even escaping overt war zones. They're just looking for a better economic life. But patriots seem to not understand. We've got no noisy neighbours. I do apologise, people. Yeah. If you hear people shouting, so a party our, our neighbours are, are somewhat very loud. Um, why do you think people can't make that link? Uh, there are people coming from war zones or countries where we have destabilised through selling despots weapons or applying sanctions or whatever it is that we've done. Well, this, this is a really good question. I, I remember Tony Blair once said very clearly, he said there was no connection between our British foreign policy in invading Iraq and, and, uh, and terrorism. So there was no, no link at all. In other words, we can go and invade and kill people on a massive scale and some individuals get seriously enraged by this, and I'm obviously not endorsing terrorism, mm. there's blowback from it and they attack us. Shall I tell you who did correct him? Baroness Manning and Buller, exactly. the so former the chief MI5. Years. Exactly. The intelligence services actually disagree with him. You're absolutely right. But he, but he, st- he stood firm and you know, he was the prime minister three or four times. Right? And his view represents the, the, the standard view. So we as a country are allowed to go in and invade and create mayhem and disorder and chaos and, and death on an unbelievable scale, but there must be no consequences for us in, in, internally at all, in terms of immigration or terrorism. No, 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 no. And if there is, it, well, it's nothing to do with our behavior. I mean, it's appalling. This again comes back to the West is not always what it claims to be or seems to be, whether it be on human rights or freedom of speech or transparency or, or, or our politicians telling us the truth. I know it sounds very cliched and cynical, but I really believe that is true based on empirical facts. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, one of the things we spoke about offline was that if you had the ears of your countrymen, your average British non-Muslim person, what things could you tell them about Islam? Like, or what would you like them to know about Muslims um, that you would assume that they probably don't know? I, I think the question is premised on the idea that there is this kind of homogenous lump of indigenous British people. I don't think that's true. I think uh, we live in a very fragmented, demographically complicated society now uh your question would have perhaps made more sense in the 1950s and before that but now I, i'm not sure it is people th- why is this the case because there are i don't know how many millions of muslims four or five million muslims 3.9 3.9 million there you are you which, know, which you know make, the exact number which makes us six and a half percent right i mentioned that is because for many many uh, non-Muslim English people, Muslims are their neighbours, their colleagues. They, you know, they, they are they are their friends, even they are whatever. And so, for them, I think they have a different response to those that live in, I don't know, a remote Scottish village somewhere who've never seen a Muslim, or, or in Shropshire, or, or in somewhere. Shropshire, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, but but in London, for example, where yeah. we are now, I don't imagine many non-Muslim white people have a problem with Muslims as such. I could be wrong, but it, it, in the generality. There probably is a hardcore that do, mm. because they are our colleagues, our friends, our neighbours. Most definitely. I, I, even we're maybe married into them as well. Uh, they could be our cousins and so on. So I think it's a bit more complicated now. But I, I think there are there are misapprehensions nonetheless. You, you're right to say to do with uh, again the, these uh, dog whistle terms. It's like the way the word without going into certain events. The way the word jihad is sure. misunderstood usually in the media because that was what that Allah word Akbar. itself was Allah Akbar. Uh, the word Sharia law, you know, it, me, it means uh, the word caliphate. These are very, those terms which are not understood correctly at all um, by the popular culture, and their misunderstanding is perpetuated by government ministers who will then cite these words as if we everyone knows what they mean but they don't have the proper context, and so they're misunderstood. So they, they are misused, actually, to push well, an agenda. Because you have a safe space, what is jihad? If you could tell the average <laughs> what, the average non-Muslim, 
white normalcy. Well, Where is jihad? Well, jihad can mean many different things. I mean, literally, it, it's an Arabic word, and it can mean exertion or struggle, exertion. So, you know, if, if I'm, um, I can, and people do legitimately use it in many different contexts. So if, if I'm a heavy smoker, and I'm struggling to give up, I'm trying really to give up my cigarette habit, well, I'm not, by the way, but say I was, that would be my jihad. And you can say that. That is a way you can use the language. Um, but in, in the classical Sharia context, jihad had a, a, a more common meaning, which is certainly meant military action. Uh, so we're talking about actual use of physical force. But uh, this is going to a different subject, but the, the, the Islamic understanding of, of war is, is hedged around with many strict uh, rules of warfare. Absolutely. So you mustn't hurt non-combatants like women. Actually mentions women, children, monks, priests. You mustn't touch them. E e even uh, destroy, trees and the environment. You can't. Worship, so it's a very, trees, very not, uh, carefully not calibrated. Torture, no mutilation. Exactly. Civilizing. So <clears throat> compare that with, say, American action, say, historically, you know, the only country in the world that ever dropped nuclear weapons on entire civilian populations. Nagasaki and Hiroshima during the Second World War. That, that in Islamic terms, in classical understanding of jihad, was completely criminal, sinful, wrong, and forbidden and Islamic. 100%. You simply couldn't do it. It, mm. it would be uh, a great evil, an egregious act. But the West doesn't have those limitations, unfortunately, as we see now in their endorsement of genocide, by providing political, economic, and military support to an ongoing genocide. They digress. What if someone says, what about the just war theory, Europe's just war theory? You ever looked into that? Yeah, well, the just war theory uh, was developed by a guy called St. Augustine in the, in the 5th century. He, mm -hmm. he, uh, it, it goes back a little bit to earlier roots. And it was developed further by St. Augustine. And it, it was a Christian-based idea that there were... And it's very similar, actually. The, is it? The, the, yes, the Western Christian just war theory is similar, is co comparable to the Islamic... Uh, absolutely. But... In practice, that's not how the West has behaved, whether it be, as I mentioned, genocides and so on. That, that's been more uh, a fig leaf, more a kind of, well, look at our theory, but whilst we get on and do something very different. And we see this about the international rule-based order now, which is a kind of a, a successor of that, which is not adhered to uh, at all, except when it's in our interests to. Sharia law. What about it? What would you tell the average man? Oh, I see, oh, I see you're asking. <laughs> well, uh, Sharia law, um, what, what we're looking at here is a Muslim understanding of society, which is very holistic. So religion in the West has been privatized. It's something you do on a Sunday morning. You, you pray privately in your home. The Islamic understanding of society is very like the Jewish understanding, actually, traditionally, um, the Orthodox Jewish understanding. And it's very much like the medieval Christian understanding as well during Christendom, where you have... You don't have this separation between the secular realm and the religious realm. The society is theocentric. It's focused on God. And God has given us uh, commandments and regulations and rules by which to live our lives successfully, how to flourish as a human being. You articulate that so nicely. So this matters. I, and, I, need, and to this is... I need to learn how to repeat this. Oh, people, people might start liking me more. <laughs> Honestly, could you make that sound so nice? Did I? Yeah, but it yeah. is nice. It's a nice idea. Because Sh it is. Sh Sharia law is a fantastic Allah, idea. Allah we're, we're, but but it, I'm, I'm trying to draw the reality, the, the parallels, the similarities are very strong in most traditional societies where the divine infuses a society. But it's just this phrase, the way it's, it's used, uh, triggers people. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the idea of, you know, if you're in the 19th century in England, you, you had Christian morality and Christian law. Of course you did. We had Christian law regulating marriage. We had Christian law doing this. This is, this is recognised as acceptable. But when Muslims do it, you, you, uh, there's a different reaction. But essentially they're the same, actually. It's the idea that there is no sec there's no secularity. Um, but there, there is space, there is plurality. In fact, Islamic, the normative Islamic position is much more pluralist than the Western liberal tradition is. There's much more room for diversity once you really get... In, in Europe, it's one-size-fits-all rule system. Uh, um, but in Islam, if you're in a Christian community, you can live according to your rules or a your Jewish courts, community. Yeah. Uh, and, and this is recognised as the right of Christians to drink alcohol, to eat pork, to do whatever Christians do. And uh, Jews do. Uh, and then Jews ditto and so on. And in the Hanafi Madhab, the largest school, of course, uh, the idea of the people of the book was extended to include other religious groups, even including Hindus and others. The ones who pay Jizya. Exactly. Yeah. So Jizya is simply, uh, as another 
Yeah. Oh. Uh, another term. Woo, yeah. Woo, just here. Um, again, this is uh, money, like a tax given to uh, the rulers. Uh, if you're Muslim, you pay zakat. If you're, uh, you, you have paid tax. And the state is obliged then to protect you, you protect your rights. And if it doesn't protect you, then it, it can't it can't enforce jizya. In fact, you should give the money back. And that happened historically. Allah well. Akbar. Um, we're going to go through all these phrases. Can I just uh, go one more? Uh, uh, right. Uh, well, the, the idea, again, this is from a Christian point of view, having, once you put this into English, which is that God is greater than, there's actually uh, in, in Christian uh, philosophy, there is that expression that God is greater than anything that can be conceived. It's actually part of the ontological argument. This is a, something formulated in Christian, in Christian philosophy. And it's actually there in Islam. It's called Allah Akbar. And when I first discovered that, I thought, but Christian theologians have been saying this for centuries. Mm. Um, but Muslims say in public. <laughs> and it's not part of an ontological argument. But the... The, uh, the stance is the same, that God cannot be uh, encapsulated in just in human language, that he is greater than anything we can conceive. God is that than which nothing greater can be conceived. And that is a, a Christian definition of the Allah Akbar. It's the same thing. So I, I will, I'm immensely keen on this phrase, Allah Akbar. I think it's great theology. If people understood really what it meant, Christians mm -hmm. should be saying it as well. Should Christian missionaries saying this, saying, well, actually, we're going to build bridges with you Muslims, and we understand what you're saying. We will say this too. And no one, they won't do that, but uh, it'd be nice if they did. Lastly, uh, caliphate. Well, that's a controversial one. Again, a dog whistle, caliphate. Mm. This is causes uh tremor in the in the minds of many people um is it's it justified just, no <laughs> it's not justified it's the idea of islamic rulership again the idea in a muslim world is that uh, there is no secularity that we live in uh, god's world and god has given us commandments to live by and one of those commandments for muslims is that we should have a, a, a single ruler, an imam or a caliph or a ruler, call him what, it doesn't really matter what you call him, um, who's a successor to the prophet in a way. Um, and he is not like a pope, he's not a theocrat, he's not to be super pious, he's simply a, 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 folk, a point of unity by which the, the, the Muslim world can rally around and give bayah to, give allegiance to. And he's, he's there to, uh, you know, it's in his name that we have the Friday prayers, for example, the, the, the Juma. So he's not like a super spiritual Pope-like figure at all. He's a very human figure. He doesn't have to be particularly holy, um, but he is a, a figurehead. And so it's nothing, nothing to be scared. We need, the West should see, it needs the Muslim world, I think, to be strong and confident in itself. If it's strong and confident in itself, it won't be a threat to anyone. You know what I mean? They'd argue it, the opposite. They said that when the Muslims get into a position of strength, then it becomes it's, it's, existential. It's the other way around. If people are not threatened, mm -hmm. if they're given rulership on, in their own terms, and they're not occupied and attacked constantly. They won't be angry. They're not going to be angry. They're, they're going to be, they're, they're going to be able to be generous and live and let live. Might even leave Europe. They might, well, <laughs> so my, my solution is the opposite of, of what is usually said. Is that the caliphate, which is, I understand, to be normative Sunni Islam. In fact, it's all schools of thought. I've not found a single school of thought that doesn't actually. With the Shia and the Imamites as well. Even the Shia yeah, might have yeah, their own understanding, yeah. but they still have a rulership, even though it's slightly yeah. different uh, in the detail. They still sure. have the idea of rulership there. Um, if you have a confident Muslim world uh, living according to the Sunnah, the Prophet, upon him peace, then you are going to have a happier world where where muslims are not you know traumatized and running away and coming to europe and invaded and hurt that's what we need we need a confident strong muslim world that we can do business with and the caliphate is a part of that uh and if the west don't see that and they want a fragmented world that is broken and a threat that that's not good for anyone now the elite, even though they would never overtly say this, the ruling neoliberal elite and the various arms and institutions of it, which which maintain and sustain the existing world order, would say, well, hold on, as as ardent capitalists, war is uh, beneficial, arms sales is beneficial, printing money is beneficial, colonizing is beneficial. This is how we sustain the existing order. Um, to have this order, to some extent, preserves us and is to one extent is what's kept the western hegemony or hegemony in 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 place so why would we want to stop that for anything else that could potentially even risk sharing that power 
with the likes of Russia, China, or a future normative well, Islamic caliphate. I that, too late, you've missed the boat. BRICS is now a reality. BRICS is growing. Saudi Arabia, Brazil, all these amazing, uh, th these countries that are not terribly Western aligned in some way. There's an attempt here to create a multipolar world here. And I think as that develops momentum, people would say, maybe dismiss it at the moment as just kind of not terribly substantive. And they may be right, but I think there's a momentum here to move away from Western he he hegemony, as you, uh, as you say, to uh, have different centers of gravity around different interests. Um, America and the West have not represented the global South interests very well, not just because of Palestine, but a whole other look in Africa and, and the mm. France, the France's relationship to its colonies in, in, in North and North and West Mali Africa. And Chad and the places. Exactly. So uh, th th there is emerging, I think, a, a new force here, which is not aligned to the West, where people are allowed to be themselves to some extent. You mentioned Russia and so on, and not mm. constantly being pushed down by, by the West. So your argument, I hear it, but as I say, they can say it all they want. The realities on the ground are changing. And I think that momentum is going to increase uh, actually going forward. And I, I say that's good. And within that space, hopefully, there can be reason to talk about Muslim rulership. Because that's all we want. We want some space, right? Yeah. Just just some space to if talk people, about if it. People would chill out more and be less stressed and will stop, you know, that will, that will have beneficial effects globally. Mm -hmm. So I think the caliphate is a key reason. A vast majority of Muslims globally want Muslim rulership. They don't want to be ruled by the IMF or Washington or 10 Downing Street. Or the World Street. Bank, yeah. Or the World Bank. I mean, it's a no-brainer, this. So give them what they want. They'll be happier and it'd be much more beneficial for them as well and islamically it's required everyone wins but the west can't see it at the moment because it's too stuck up its own <laughs> what happens when they start knocking on the doors of vienna you need to explain what you mean by that so if someone's like okay paul i'll <coughs> i'll humor you I'll, I'll play along with you yeah give them what they want give them their independence give them their resources give them all the strategic uh, navy routes or maritime routes give them let's remove our bases let's shut shop and leave them as it is once they're strengthened and they're happy and they're jolly and they're spiritually <laughs> uplifted and united jolly then, then jolly then, muslims yeah, okay. then kind the, of jolly muslims then, yeah. then, then yeah. they're knocking on the doors of vienna and budapest again well this you're referring of course to uh the ottoman empire because you posted attempt. something you posted something recently the Ottoman emblem and it went viral. Yeah, but it doesn't mean that ottoman empire is perfect it's around for what six, oh, 700 years 623 God, he you knows exactly how many Muslims are around the country. He knows exactly how many years the Ottoman Empire. He probably knows the name and address of all these Muslims as well. Very <laughs> no, no, impressive. No. Be careful what I say here. You're no, going to no, pee me out. No, I mean, the Ottoman Empire was around for centuries. It doesn't mean everything he did was right. Whether or not they were right to go into to Vienna like that, I don't know. And I'm not really... This is centuries ago. Uh, what, what I want is, a, as we all want, is a strong Muslim polity because it won't be a threat to other people then. It's not going to invade Europe. I mean, we're not... I've not had any Muslims interested in invading it. We're already no, here. No. We're already here, yeah. actually. In Vienna, we weren't here. We are already here. Mm -hmm. It's the fastest growing religion in, in Europe. They're going to have to come to terms with this and deal with this. Well, they are, but badly at the moment, in France, particularly, in Germany particularly. Mm -hmm. So I think the whole political and historical landscape is different now. It's no longer them out there as a threat to us. The Ottoman Empire doesn't exist. We're already in Europe and we're here to stay. And the truth was, we always were in Europe. Absolutely. Look at Andalusia. Uh, is the Islamic Balkans. Spain and Portugal, uh, southern parts of Italy, the Balkans, and the Balkans. It, it was a majority Muslim white yep. nation, yep. and so we, we we always were here actually. Mm. So this kind of binary kind of them outside is, is 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 what Manitian. Have you ever heard that term? Have I pronounced it wrong? I the whole know. kind of when you split the world to us and them. I'm sure the word is Manitian. I'll just try. Uh, uh, maybe I'll, I'll look it up later. Um, uh, yeah. um, you've hosted many Islamic uh, economists and experts. Uh, how realistic, from your interactions with them, is moving away from the dollar? Well, that's what ultimately it's all pinned on, isn't it? It's all pinned well, I've only on actually had interview one economist actually, um, and uh, I don't know the answer to that question. That really is not. Have my... you ever explored that with anyone? No, not to my knowledge. No, okay. no. But, but, but I mean, it's a good question. I think uh, as we see the rise of China and Russia and the BRICS countries, particularly, that question will have to arise: Do we do we stay with the dollar, which is the world's currency? Hopefully not, actually, because it ties in then with American financial power, which is the problem in the first place. Hmm. We, we need a multipolar world, uh, uh, and there's some Russian philosophers famously are talking about this. I think it's a good thing. And it will give that space, I think, for the Muslim world to emerge as a mature political reality. As I keep on saying, that can only be good for the whole world, in my view. Um, your praise or brotherly dig about my knowledge on numbers and stats. <laughs> um, census 2021, 
Um, yeah. eight, eight 8% of all British Muslims identify as white, English, Welsh, Scottish, or Northern Irish. That's 312,000. Um, many of them would have come from a Christian heritage or Christian background. Uh, one of the interactions we had, and you fed back to me, and, I, and I, I'm glad you said it to me, it was when I asked Jim Dowson the questions about the Bible and, and, and the position on alcohol and stuff like that. You're like, whoa, 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 Dilly, they're not, Christianity is not, a, like, it's not so de defined as we are, our aqidah, our articles of faith, and so right. it's a bit different. Yeah. So onto this conversation about Christianity, it's an area which I'm not well versed in. It's an area in which I've not engaged in in terms of apologetics. Um, how does the Christianity of today differ to the Islam that we understand, that we deem to be somewhat consensual, somewhat unifying? Like, you know, Sunni Islam, Sunni Muslims, 80-85%, four madhabs, three schools of theology, pretty much that's it. And there's pretty much an overwhelming overlap and agreement on most things. Yes. Is that the case of Christianity? No. And I think there's one thing that many Muslims, and it's not just Muslims, many people in general don't, uh, appreciate uh, when it comes to Islam and Christianity as if they're kind of just polar equivalents they're not really as you rightly say Islam uh, is overwhelmingly Sunni Muslims uh, the vast majority of Muslims in the world are mainstream orthodox Sunni Muslims yeah you'll get a very few modernist Muslims on the fringes and a few other sects but basically it, it's wherever you go you're going to find pretty much the same it's absolutely not true in Christianity so for, so for the viewers and listeners uh, 80-85% yeah, Sunnis will either be Hanafi, Maliki, Shafi or Hanbali and from those th four schools of jurisprudence they'll either be an Athari, Ash'ari or Maturidi and fall somewhere within that broad Sunni spectrum, right? Yeah, but even that I think is, is too obscure. I mean, who, who, how many people can define the difference between they can't, say, the vast majority Athari can't. and Matur Maturidi? But they I mean, I'd, be, I'd be hard pressed to define it. I mean, yeah. I have some idea, but I really have to think hard. And, and so vast majority I'm not really interested or know what the differences are. Well, there's practices that um, they've inherited from their forefathers. Yeah, who, we're talking about praying five times yes. a day. Yes. We're talking about Ramadan, yeah. uh, you know, which is coming up to uh, paying zakah. We're talking about believing the core creed. I think that's, you know. Allah, the angels, the exa prophets, exactly. the, 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 the scriptures, six, the six good and bad items comes from Allah. Of, of belief, their and, judgment, uh, of yeah. Imam, exactly, and the, and the five pillars. Always accept. I'm, I've, it's very hard for me to think of anyone who, who denies that. I mean, there probably are one or two. It's very unusual. Christianity, the equivalent of Christianity is not, it's not the case at all. So At all? At all. Because Christianity, like Judaism, in the West has become secularized. Okay, it's lost its its spiritual and theological foundation. It lost it probably two or three hundred, a hundred years ago. So now to be a Christian, say if you're in the Church of England, the established church of this country, what does what does a Church of England person believe about say gay marriage? Oh well, I've no idea because most of them are probably in favour of it. Actually, a small minority are not. Well, what do you think about abortion? Well, probably most are in favour of it. Okay. Well, what do you believe? I'm going to, what do you think about Jesus? Who was Jesus? Some will say he was just a man. Some will say he was God. Some will say he was whatever. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're all over the place. But I know if I would ask those questions of a Muslim I've never met before, I'm boom, pretty boom, sure. Boom. boom, boom, all that tick, tick, tick. I know exactly what they're going to say. They might umanar a bit about stuff but they're you know about talking about the lgbt yeah. depending on how how they want to present it but they won't disagree on the core point which mm -hmm. is boom 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 so christianity has become very secular as is judaism judaism now which used to i mean i'm generalizing here but most jews used to be orthodox jews who used to submit to the torah most jews today have a slightly different religion it's called zionism and that is their central preoccupation I mean, it's controversial to say, I, I think it's accurate yeah. that their, their number one concern is not so much to please God as understood in the Mosaic revelation, but in terms of protecting that state in the Middle East at the moment. Um, I wish it wasn't true, but I think that's the case. So Christianity is secularized. It's no, no longer theocentric. It's been largely taken over by secular liberal humanism as their ethos. So, you know, what, what, what's, the, what's the Christian view on oh, live and let live? Be good to your neighbours. Um, Turn sort of the other thing. cheek. Turn the other cheek. Exactly. This is Christianity. You go to the Gospels in the New Testament, you won't find that. You might find the phrase, one or two phrases, mm -hmm. like, Turn the other cheek. But, but it's focused on God big time and following his commandments and taking faith really seriously. And that's disappeared. And the only people in the world today, generalising now, 
who do take God seriously are Muslims, in my experience. Absolutely. And it's not even a generational thing like, oh, the older generation are taking it seriously, the younger people less. They took it seriously as well. It's the other way around. Mm. And that recent survey, the census, I, I spoke to Professor Linda Woodhead, who's a professor of sociology of religion at King's College here in London. She's, she's a world expert on this. And she came on blogging theology to talk about it. Religion's on the decline in this country. It's becoming more secularised. People are not going to church or synagogue, with a one exception, Muslims and Islam. And it's the other way around. Yep. And the younger generation are more practising than their parents, who are more practising than their parents. They're going back to the fourth generation, perhaps, of immigrants to the UK. It's the other way around. So Islam is an incredible success story. And amongst all the gloom in the world, there's a lot of very thank the war terrible on terror gloom. and 9-11 for that. But the, the, in, a sense, in that sense, Islam is an incredible success story globally. Incredible. Without, without a civilizational support, I must say. Without add. the caliphate, without this civilizational support, because of the intrinsic appeal of the religion, I would argue, it provides this moral framework, this holistic way of living, this beautiful example of the Prophet Muhammad that's upon awesome. him. He is one extraordinary human being. Mm -hmm. People in the West don't know of this guy. That's, that's one of the big reasons I became a Muslim is because of him. You know, his example, his life, unbelievable. Is the marriage to Aisha still a contentious issue for you when you, <laughs> when you engage with people? It is, yes. I was at Speaker's Corner last Sunday and um, I was introduced to a lady from Birmingham who, I think she was a Buddhist. Uh, anyway, she, this was her first question to me. Because it's a common thing. About Asia Aisha. So yeah. I explained why it's simply not an issue mm. um, because you know, it's, it's all to do with, uh, without going into the, you know, the age, very, very simply and very briefly, this is my take on it. We have a Bukhari Hadith which reports that she... Uh, Aisha was six, I think, when she was betrothed, and nine when the marriage yeah. was consummated. This hadith actually from Aisha herself. She is the origin of this mm -hmm. narration, interestingly. It's Bukhari, which means it's authentic. Yeah. Um, but it's not an issue because the, 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 the age of consummation of a marriage in traditional cultures and in Islam is the age of puberty. It's the same in the Bible. Mm. So how old is Ma how old was Mary probably when she got married or, or consummated her marriage? Because we believe she had sons and daughters. You know, she had sons and daughters. Not she wasn't a virgin forever yeah. and ever. Well, she might have been the same age of Aisha, maybe 10, 12. Some Catholic authorities say she was twelve years old, and Joseph traditionally was much older. This is because in traditional societies, like well, um, in in Judaism, uh, the bar mitzvah. So when does a boy become a man? Yeah. yeah, in his early teens, yeah. when he becomes a full member of the Jewish community, not when he is 18, according to British law. Like how we have Balik, when someone is like, really? well, yeah, yeah. Like it's the same thing, right. puberty, certain hairs, certain it's puberty. Yeah. Puberty is, is when you become a full member of the community. Yeah. And at that point, you're expected to take on the responsibilities of an adult. And that happens much earlier. So what in the West we've done the last hundred years, we invented this thing called teenagehood and youth, and it gets ever longer and extended. So <laughs> I, I've got a friend of mine, <laughs> who's um, in his mid-30s. He, he considers himself a youth. And I'm thinking, when I was a kid, a 30-year-old guy was middle-aged. But, you know, he said, no, 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 it's, it's just, no, I'm, I'm young. Okay, fine, Mr. 35-year-old. 35 teen. I mean, come on. I mean, but this is all cultural. Yeah. This is pure culture. So d d did the Prophet Muhammad upon him, he's, were his marriages according to the, the conventions and customs of the time? Yes. Are they, are they conventions and norms which are universally accepted apart from the West until 100 years ago? Yes. Of course. Uh, the West has changed definitions and norms about sexuality and marriage and everything else so much that this has become an issue now. And, and, and J Jonathan Brown, the, the American professor and Muslim, uh, did some research on this. And no one that he could find before the 20th century ever criticised yeah. the prophet on this issue. They criticised about Anything and everything else, most of it rubbish. This one issue was never brought up. Until the last hundred years. Until the beginning of the 20th century. Why? Because the West suddenly changed its understandings of childhood and youth and teenagehood. That's when it became an issue. So the issue is a cultural one. It's not, it's not a moral issue in that sense. It's also important, like, when you look at examples like in Portugal and other parts of EU yeah. member states, the age of consent is 14. Yeah. In the state of Texas, you can get married at the age of 12 with parental uh, permission. Right. In the state of California, there has no age of consent for marriage. You can marry a two-year-old in California mm -hmm. legally. And the people, the people forget there's a difference between, uh, between betrothing and marriage and consummation of the marriage. Mm -hmm. See, if the Prophet Muhammad upon him was a pedophile, people have even saying that, and they said, but this is the accusation. 
he married he, he was betrothed to her married her at six but he waited three years why did he wait three years to consume the, what, what what happened at nine Absolutely. what happened at nine was what inevitably would happen in civil, in any civilized society according to traditional norms is puberty mm -hmm. and she was a biological and social adult at that point so betrothal and actual consummation are not the con concurrent they, they happen at different times coming back to christianity so do you feel like the whole kind of jim dowson brand of christianity uh you know do you think that's like a dying breed of it do you think they're far and few between you might find it a bit in america or do you think that this is still very much mainstream that kind of sentiment that kind of what well, you, what you observe. people have had to know who he is and what he represents in in Northern Ireland, but it's a, a pretty. So, so, so Jim yeah. Dawson is the founder of Britain First. He's a Christian preacher. Yeah. He's a Presbyterian uh, Protestant of the Ulster type. I hope I've uh, defined you properly, Jim. Um, and he's and he's still very much what we would call in our very shadid and quite very hard on Christian laws and Christian values. And yeah, sure, in that part of Northern Ireland, Belfast. It, it, it may resonate, but I can't see that resonating in main, mainland England for some reason. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. I, I think what, what the constituency he represents and the way you described it, it is a dying breed. Uh, and in some ways I regret that. And so other, other ways I don't regret it, but in some I do. Um, because, uh, for example, he, he uh, I think in the, on the, your interview with him, you mentioned a a alcohol. Alcohol, yeah. And, and um, as, as far as I'm aware, everyone states here... Christians accept alcohol now, it's simply not an issue. It's not an issue. However, that wasn't always true. If you go back to the 19th century, I remember when I first went to the States, I stayed in a place called Evanston in Illinois, it's where Chicago is, mm -hmm. uh, just with friends. And I didn't know until I stayed there that it is the epicenter of the temperance movement in the United States. In the beginning of the 18th, 19th centuries, uh, all the, all the bars were closed. Uh, women were fed up with their husbands being drunk and abusing them. There was a, a massive movement against, a religiously Christian-inspired movement against alcohol as the demon drink that destroys marriages, destroys lives. Of course, it still does now, obviously. According to them, is there scriptural basis for well, the they, permissibility? They claim it is. I, I don't want to get, I mean, no, no, that, that, that's, there is. There is, yeah. And there is an argument about that, which, which is, I don't want really to get into that because I don't really agree with their argument. Okay. But but I, uh, in terms of what the actual New Testament actually says, but their impulse was born of the shock of seeing so much suffering and evil caused by alcohol and in britain and england we had the temperance movement here with people like uh, john wesley who who ends up founding methodism mm -hmm. huge temperance movement which swept the country and closed down bars and pubs all over the place this is a christian inspired mood now all that is gone and methodism exists but i don't think is temperance at all they're not campaigning against alcohol the only people now who are continuing that christian tradition are muslims actually how would a britain or a europe look like without alcohol there'd be a lot more but, but the, the the health services would not be so burdened with disease and i mean the, the list of medical conditions and and uh, violence robbery uh, rape sexual abuse i mean is horrific caused by people whose inhibitions are affected by uh drink drinking alcohol what do you then do to wind down and have a jolly and just relax and kick back then ah oh, but that's that's a good point because before I was a Muslim, I I drank alcohol. I it wasn't a big drinker. I certainly drank it, wine and so on. And I, and when you're out with your mates, you drank alcohol. And I couldn't understand how you could have a good time without booze. It is impossible. So when I became Muslim, I stopped drinking, obviously. Mm -hmm. And I discovered that you could have a good time with your mates, actually a very good time, without any alcohol at all. It was like a revelation to me. <laughs> and that's why I don't miss alcohol at all now, because I just don't see the point of it. It just befuddles your brain and doesn't be, bring you any benefit. But I learned actually you can have a, um, a good sober time without all the downside by not drinking alcohol. I had to discover that for myself. How, what was your thoughts on the Qatar World Cup coverage? Because uh, I know lots was happening there at the time. And so one of the debates and discussions were about the accessibility of alcohol or, set, or, or certain areas that were mm. cordoned off. And, uh, you know, the organisers purposely made bars and pubs far away which is actually not true the Qataris were very accommodating really? uh, no, I, I didn't go actually but yeah. yeah but um uh, the coverage was outrageous yeah um the coverage of the Qatar World Cup in the Western media was outrageous and I guess that's linked to a conversation we've been having which was you've been having some kind of not an epiphany but somewhat of an awakening <laughs> yeah. a realization of some racial disparity in how 
wars and events are kind of covered when the perpetrators or the protagonists yes. are white and non-white. But this, uh, this comes back to Gaza, really, yeah, for me. Yeah. Was Gaza a bit of an eye-opener for you? Yeah, I, I, and, and because I've been travelling a lot in the last year and a half uh, to do with work, I, 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 um, I've spoken to a lot of people, I've noticed a trend, a pattern, which I think you really... I, I've never heard anyone contradict this pattern that I've vocalised and I'm about to express now. So whenever I go away, whether it be the Middle East or America or France all the time and wherever, Germany, um, I have my passport and I go through passport control. And it's a breeze. Oh, is it a breeze? Well, he isn't for I me. I mean, okay, there's, sometimes there can be cues. He isn't for me. Sometimes, but that's not, that's not, that's because there are, you know, you get lots of planes arriving at the same time mm -hmm. or there's a shortage of staff. But when you actually get to the, the guy or, or the woman at, at the passport control, not a problem. So I, I went to the States last year, uh, San Francisco airport, and uh, I was a bit apprehensive. I thought, well, I'm a Muslim now, what's going on? <laughs> but um, the guy in front of me was asked three questions and I could hear, and I knew exactly what the three questions, you know, purpose of, purpose, purpose of your visit, how long are you going to be here for, where are you staying? So I had all my answers in my head. Um, and I, th I think it took about 25 seconds to process me at passport control at San Francisco in America. Lucky you. Easy. Well, now you say lucky you because I didn't realise I was lucky. Mm. I just thought this was normal. <laughs> So, why am I mentioning this? Because actually, it turns out I am very privileged, and I didn't know this because I'm a frequent traveller. I get to hear other people's stories who've also travelled to the same destination. It's like I was in in Jordan several months ago, and I spoke to I won't, I don't, I won't identify him, but he was a very senior executive in a um, IT corporation in California. Okay. <laughs> I'm trying not to identify, and um, he was a brown guy. Well, he's a brown guy actually. And um, so he'd fly first class from London to San Francisco on a regular basis for work. Every time he went there, he was stopped. Every time he had to answer questions about, I mean, a lot of questions and mm -hmm. delays. Without fail, he got treated like that. And he's a very respectable guy, uh, very bright, uh, et cetera. First class guy. I mean, literally, he travels first class. And... I have spoken to many, many people, uh, uh, people who are not white, who had exactly the same experience. And even when they go to Muslim countries, they have the same experience. Sometimes it's worse in the Muslim countries. And so I, I, a friend who goes to back to Egypt, he is from Egypt. He doesn't live there now. Mm -hmm. And when he goes back, he gets stopped. <laughs> and he's Egyptian. Um, so it's not just... It's slightly more complicated, but it's the same reality. And that is white... Uh, and this is... A fair conclusion, I think, that people like me get treated differently. Um, I, I have routinely. A, it's not unusual. It's just always like that. I see privilege in a bit of a different way, Paul. Let me know let me know if you agree or disagree with this. My thinking of privilege is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he he is blessed you with privilege. So you don't have no choice being born into nobility. You have no choice being born into um, aristocracy or a rich family or a wealthy family or a poor family uh, in terms of privilege, sorry. That's your qadr. You, Allah's just given you that. So long as you, and you could possibly even live according to those privileges. And I don't think it's right to actually attack people for privileges because as Muslims, we see it as this is something Allah's ordained for you, has written for you, and it can actually change in your lifetime. You can be privileged at one point in your life and be very underprivileged in a, in, in a different part of your life mm -hmm. uh, later on or something like this. But it exists. And I don't think I understand it from the kind of pulse, modern, lefty kind of way. But it does exist in some. It does exist. But um, See, I don't think. It, uh, I don't I, think we should need to beat uh, uh, white people over about it. No, I'm, it. I'm not. I, I'm simply reporting what I've seen. I'm not making. I am reaching a conclusion, uh, uh, and I'm, I'm saying that the way I'm treated shouldn't be a privilege. It should be the norm for everyone. I don't, I don't think I'm being. I think the treatment I get in myself is not a privilege. It's just normal. I, I should be able to pass quickly through passport control, but that should be the case for everyone. And I've just noticed it's not. So I don't see it as a privilege. It, it rel relatively, is, I'm advantaged, but in itself, it's not a privilege. It's just how things should be, and it's not how it's not happening like that for uh, non-whites, basically. And, um, and has Gaza impacted that? Has Gaza further? Well, yes. Eyes? Um, so I've got my my notes here because there, there were um, several ways uh, Gaza I've has exposed so much about the West. Um, so the, one of the things is about free speech, of course. <laughs> and I remember going on a march, uh, a pro-Palestinian march. I think it was the first really, really big one, started at High Park. And, oh, because I was interviewed by one of your Five Pillars c colleagues. Robert. Yeah. And um, 
And I remember the Home Secretary in Britain saying that this was a hate march. Braverman at the time. Yes. And I was stunned because, you know, the, the march was full of families, young people, kids. Uh, people were outraged and very upset about what was happening to uh, the people in Palestine. But there was no hatred there was no, at all. I didn't see it. I just really didn't. And I think that was the, my first sense that the the state viewed pro-Palestinian views as illegitimate, as wrong, as bad, and to be shut down. And we've, we've seen this, I've seen this in, in France and other countries where Palestinian marches have been uh, shut down. Um, and people lose their jobs if they speak out. In America, we, we have a, a mutual friend uh, who has lost his uh, job for the offence of speaking out for the Palestinians. Yes. Um, and this is shocking. This is ongoing. This hasn't gone away. Uh, and there'll be um, others. It seems like that it's got its head in that way. Others with certain yeah. beliefs and views yeah. will probably lose their jobs. And, yeah. and we all have to self-censor a bit. We can't speak uh, as openly as we'd like uh, about situations that if it was Russia invading Ukraine and we were simply to speak up in support of the Ukrainians and their resistance to occupation, if we used the same language mm. in a comparable situation, mm. we wouldn't have a problem. So it's not the objective situation that's the issue. It's the way that our state has taken sides and has demonised and criminalised opposition. So that's one, one thing. Uh, the other thing um, is about well, democracy. This is an allied point. Um, you know, if, if, you, if, you, if the population want a ceasefire, the governments will ignore it. But this goes back to Tony Blair's time when during the Iraq during war, Iraq. when I went on that march, and he just ignored it. You know, it doesn't matter what the population think. Um, but um, the thing that really got me is about international law, a rule-based international law, which our politicians are very keen on. And they're Championing very, and they're very sincere yeah. about this and earnest about this, and we all believe them. It's all, I can't use rude words on this channel, but it, shall we say it's all rubbish? Of course it is. And that's not a cynical political bias saying that. It's obvious because... At least in the application sense, in terms of consistency, yeah. for sure. But but you see, the Chinese constitution guarantees freedom of religion. North Korea guarantees freedom of religion, it's constitution. I mean, so what? It's on a piece of paper. The question is, is it real? Does it does it pan out in reality? And it doesn't. Um, because, you know, I, I remember lots of the head of the EU, our British politicians, Labour and Conservative, when Israel first said that we are cutting off water, we're cutting off food aid and medical aid to the Palestinian population as part of their uh, military. And that was early on. That was. And that was early on. And I remember that some of these people being quizzed on British television, the, the, foreign, the foreign affairs spokesman on the Labour Party mm. and the Labour Party being quizzed on this. I forget her name. And I saw this and surely you condemn this surely this is unacceptable oh no I, I, we, we, Israel David has Lammy a, as well yeah we're right to, Israel has a right to defend itself whatever happened to international you this is genocide if you cut off water and food and medical care from a population that's like a war crime you know and yet not one British politician mainstream mainstream politician yeah. said that agreed to that statement even though they, when it came to Russian invasion, Russian invasion of Ukraine, they did say that for identical sets of circumstances. So this is the discrediting of the West now, unfortunately. I say unfortunately because you know, I want them to be credible. They're not anymore. Mm. Arguably, perhaps they never were. But um, for many of us, it's a wake-up call. And the reason, uh, one of the main reasons, I think, I think there's good evidence for this, why they're different. There, there are several reasons, but one of the reasons is Palestinians are not white and they're Muslims mainly. Ukrainians are white and mostly Christian actually. And I think that is one of the main reasons why they're treated so differently. So in other words, hardcore racist hegemony is a reason why there's a difference. And I found that really hard to accept for a long, long time because in Britain, in London, we live in a society which constantly promotes diversity, which constantly goes on about the evils of racism, obviously. Mm -hmm. We live in a Labour-controlled London. Of course. I mean, they don't support racism. Of course they don't. But the thing is, I think internally they don't, but in terms of its posture vis-a-vis -vis the world, particularly brown people and Muslims, it is racist. There are other factors involved, I think, but this is a, a key reason. The West is, I've concluded, supremacist and racist in its relationship with the global south 
Now, I know a lot of people have already included that years ago. I'm a late comer. I'm a late learner. Forgive me for being slow. No, no, but it's all. taking Gaza to really wake me up to this global dynamic, which doesn't actually exist in my neighbourhood. In uh, it's, it's an international thing, mm. if you see what I mean. It's omatic still. Yes. What's your thoughts on the fact that there have been historical instances where it can be argued Britain has militarily intervened uh, to help the Muslims? You know, I just saw a video from 1981, Thatcher telling the Afghan Mujahideen that the, the hearts of the free world are with you. <laughs> and that was straight after her promising two and a half million pounds of British taxpayers' money to the Afghan Mujahideen. Or that Cameron did intervene in Libya. So we have instances where, you know, the jihad, the, the Britain will support the jihad. They support the jihad in Bosnia. Well, I, I, I know, I know you better. I know, I know. This is a slight. Uh, you're not being serious because. Um, no, no. I'm, 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 I want you to explain why I'm not being serious. Because <laughs> uh, it's absurd. Okay, the Mujahideen. Uh, I've actually seen the articles in the Times newspaper which talk about Bin Laden as a great hero. Yeah, the Independent called him a great hero. Right. But the reason was it's simple. At that time, our enemy was the Soviet Union. Was communism. And uh, Al Qaeda didn't exist at that time, so it was in our interest, as the the CIA were involved in Afghanistan, to try and get the Russians out of Afghanistan because they were there. The Russian communists were in Afghanistan, occupying it. So it was all part of this geopolitical anti-communist uh, crusade. Um, it was nothing to do with helping Muslims or to anyway supporting the Ummah at all. It was because they were against communism, and you know it was perfectly fine for Muslims to be against communism as well. So I think uh, at that time, you know, Osama bin Laden was backed by America, and <laughs> ironically, trained. and trained in the CIA. Yeah. And, you know, I'm not saying bin Laden was wrong to, but, I, I, but that it wasn't any, it wasn't a pro-Muslim move at all. It was mm. an anti communist anti-russian move and you mentioned libya well i bet they're regretting that day when Gaddafi yeah. was taken out it, it, the place is to chaos so that was to do with the Gaddafi thing about sure. it wasn't because they love muslims or wants to help muslims uh, at all final question of the podcast to close it um at the time of filming there was a lot of discussion about a general election looming it's very likely it's going to happen this year mm. um we've got the ramping up of policies and censorship with regards to what you can and cannot say with regards to Palestine and Gaza. Yeah. Um, we're in a very interesting place in terms of where the country is heading. Will it follow the trend of the rest of Europe? Will its destination be a, a tad different to its uh, to the Europeans? Final question to you, where do you see Britain heading in the next couple of years, two or three years? Well, it seems certain there'll be a Labour victory. I mean, under Keir Starmer, the head of the Labour Party, um, he's now become basically a reflection of the Conservative Party. He, you know, since his predecessor um, was kicked out, whose name is Jeremy Corbyn, Jeremy Corbyn, uh, who was very pro-Palestinian and anti-Zionist, th that wasn't permitted to continue. Uh, he was removed, and now we have someone who, in my view, is indistinguishable from the current Conservative government on key areas, certainly on foreign policy, there's no mm -hmm. difference. So there's, it, it, there'll be a change of personnel. I don't think there's going to be a change in any other respect at all. So the label on the tin may say, oh, the Labour's in power, but th th they've been thoroughly uh, um, it, it become part of the establishment now. Um, the big change uh, that interests me, so there's no no change there really. The big change is going to be in Europe when a Mar Marine Le Pen almost certainly will win there. Uh, Gert Wilders in Holland, if, when he eventually takes power, under what conditions he'll be clipped, his wings will be clipped, but mm -hmm. he'll still be head of head of the, the government there. Mm -hmm. um, and and, and in, the, in Germany and other countries, we, with the ascendancy of the populist right, who are viscerally anti-Muslim and pro-Zionist, pro this is the danger. With Trump in power, almost certainly in the States, of course, because there's also an election there. Yep. So we're going to have Labour in power here, the Republican, well, Trump uh, back Not in Republicans power. Republicans and Trump in power. Yeah, no about the Republicans. It's yeah. Trump that's coming back in yeah. power. <laughs> the Republicans are just kind of the vehicle yeah. uh, for him. He, he, he is the party, really. Yeah. Um, so we're going to have a populist right-wing nationalist hegemony in Europe and in America, Europe, uh, Britain will have the Labour Party, but pff, it's pretty much business as usual, in my view. Yeah, Maybe yeah. slightly less toxic. But when it comes to the Gaza, uh, the Gaza genocide, they are full square behind it. Absolutely. So these are enemies of. They should be prosecuted under war crime. I mean, for supporting war crimes, these people. Seriously, mm -hmm. I, I don't know why they're. But the Tony Blair was never prosecuted. 
uh, obviously, and, and he, he, many people consider him to be a war criminal. Mm. So there's no hope. There's no um, the Bush, Bush senior, Bush junior, rather. Um, you know, he was never prosecuted. What's your thoughts on the ICJ as an institution? In International Criminal Court. Yeah. Well, if um, well, we'll see what ruling it gives. Uh, my my bet is I'm not allowed to bet, but if I was allowed to bet, I would say that they will rule that genocide happened. If they didn't, it would be the end of that institution because no one would have any. <laughs> we can see it. I can see it on my Twitter feed. I don't mm. need the ICC to tell me there's genocide going on. Sure. So, but I, I think they will rule. Uh, and then the problem then how America deals with that and how Israel deals with that. They'll probably just ignore it and carry on anyway. So I think we're into going into choppy waters. But in the longer term, I'm very optimistic. The sooner is to be optimistic, and I think we will have a better world. And inshallah, the Muslim world will unite under a, a just ruler. Inshallah. Not a ruler, a just, just ruler. That's what I really want. Any ruler. We don't want Gaddafi back in. Yeah, we want a sure. just ruler who will unify the Ummah, because whatever what all Muslims want. Mm. And then that can be a real light of justice in the world as inshallah. a counterpoint to the genocide supporting West at the moment. Inshallah. Paul, inshallah. I mean, Paul, it was an absolute honour having you on. It, it was an absolute pleasure, sir. It wasn't that bad, was it? Um, no, it was, it was fine. It was. <laughs> one well, of those trick questions. No, no, no. it was fine. Uh, inshallah, no, it was I, hope good. It, I hope it's the first of many times that you're going to come on. Inshallah. My dear brothers and sisters and friends and foes, I hope you enjoyed today's <laughs> podcast as much as I did. If you did, then remember to click subscribe to the Five Players YouTube channel. If you're an audio podcast listener, you can find us on all the major platforms. Until next time, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.